Israel's Prime Minister says the war against Hamas has entered a new stage as ground operations expand inside Gaza. More than two million people in Gaza are effectively cut off from the outside world and residents say the attacks have been the most intense of the war so far. Well, joining me live is host of a podcast called The Voices of War, veteran Maslik, known as Maz. Maz, how are you? Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Janie. Thanks for having me. So you've got a very interesting history. You're a survivor of the Bosnian War. You fought in war and have been a humanitarian in Iraq and are currently undertaking a PhD in military ethics, to name a few. But firstly, Maz, describe what it was like living in a war. I believe you were 10 years old at the time. Yeah, that's, that's right, Janie. I mean, I was 10 when the war broke out in Sarajevo, which is where I was born and raised. Uh, and I guess the easiest way to describe it is that it is hell. Everything stops. Everything you know ceases to exist as it did merely a few days before. I mean, we spent our time uh, in the cellar uh, because of the ongoing relentless bombard bombardment that was going on uh, effectively from day one of the war uh, in Sarajevo. I was lucky. I was one of the lucky few that got to leave the city three months into the siege. Uh, and as most of your viewers will know, Sarajevo uh, still holds a very dark record that it is the longest siege of a city in modern history. Uh, and it was, uh, yeah, and, and I often say to people, uh, people don't appreciate the true costs of war or what war really is until they are on the receiving end of some really, really heavy munitions. Uh, because that changes your perspective drastically as to the need and want for war, as well as what price those who are innocent are paying uh, for the whims and strategic interests uh, of those in charge. And you mentioned the innocent. We just saw Julia Bradley, our reporter there in Sydney, where they were holding a, a rally there for the hostages taken from Hamas on October 7. Maz, what is your opinion on why Hamas took the hostages in the first place? Yeah, look, Jamie, that's a really good question. And it's one that's really important, I think, for us to really dig into and understand. I mean, Hamas has effectively set a trap for Israel. Uh, when they committed the atrocities, condemnable atrocities, that they did on the 7th of October, they knew, absolutely knew, that if Israel has to respond and has to respond with overwhelming force. But just by the fact that they took the hostages, 200-plus hostages, they also knew that Israel cannot respond immediately with a ground offensive. Uh, because I think it was also mentioned in a previous uh, segment, uh, Israel does take the life of its citizens very, very seriously, and rightly so. Uh, so now Israel is stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, they can't really go in into the ground offensive as, uh, uh, as probably they want to. Uh, and we're seeing the delays in that. Uh, you know, it's now been 20, more, more than 20 days since uh, the original atrocities. And they're forced to do aerial bombardment. And we're also seeing the effects of that. I'm sure Hamas is celebrating that. I'm sure Hamas is celebrating the amount of innocent civilians that are being killed during these bombardments. I mean, the, you know, the figures are varied and, you know, we don't know what we can trust or not, but, you know, seven plus thousand uh, uh, killed, 3,000 children killed. I mean, this, these figures, even if they're overblown by 50 percent, would be extraordinary. Uh, and it would have an impact, an extraordinary impact on the civilians living there. And Hamas knows that. And that's why they want the civilians to stay where they are. They want the civilians to die. Uh, and Israel, on the other hand, uh, unfortunately, uh, in my view, is slowly losing the moral high ground because they are responding emotively. They can't be blamed for that. But it certainly doesn't justify ongoing killing of those who are innocent, especially when you are achieving questionable military objectives. Uh, and I don't know if they really are. Yeah, it's a very complicated situation. And, you know, seeing people from Gaza who are being told to go from north to south and then questions are being raised as to where they go from there and how they can hide. And we're seeing yeah. and reading all sorts of things, which, again, we're trying to figure out what is factual and, and not. But under international law, Israel's firm in saying that they are abiding by international law. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I'm, 
Of course, Israel would say that. I mean, uh, they have to say that. Uh, they would certainly not admit that they're doing anything wrong. Uh, but the international community is, it, it's the role of the international community to get involved. Uh, I think uh, Yuval Noah Harari put it really, really well. Israelis, as well as the Palestinians, right now are acting on pure emotion. They are not necessarily rational in their decision making, especially when it comes to these types of aerial bombardments where suburbs are flattened. They cannot be, we cannot expect Israel to contain its, its, its wish for revenge. And, and, and this is language that Netanyahu is using, revenge, vengeance, uh, you know, to, ex to, to kill human animals, to kill uh, bloodthirsty uh, 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 demons and, and, and these types of language, right, which is highly moralized language. We can understand that. Equally, on the Palestinian side, we can understand that if your child dies and you're an innocent, and most of these people are innocent in the true sense of the word, then of course you're going to be radicalized uh, to the point of wanting to stand up against Israel, who you're seeing as a state that is committing, you know, by certainly by their accounts, uh, ethnic cleansing, or uh, you know, some are even calling it genocide, mm. but most definitely collective punishment. We've got, and this is where we really need to, you know, as Yuval, yes, sorry, go. On. Oh no, just um, we have to wrap it up. Unfortunately, um, I just wanted to quickly ask you um, your podcast and and some of the people that you have on the podcast, and um, yeah, we had, we don't have too long, but um, if you can just give us a little bit of an idea. Uh, of course, I mean, what I try to do, Janie, uh, is is something very much that you're trying to do, and that's scratch below the simple narratives uh, that, that we're exposed to in our legacy social media. Uh, you know, I'm trying to add a bit of colour to the black and white uh, that seems to exist. So I, I interview people from all sides of the uh, or full spectrum of, of war, whether it's humanitarians, refugees, generals, soldiers, uh, peacemakers, uh, military ethicists, etc. Uh, and in the more, most recent, uh, I guess, escalation of violence in Israel. I've, I've, I've interviewed people like Chris Gunnis, who was a former UNRWA spokesperson. I've most recently, I interviewed David uh, Livingston Smith, who is a, a Jew, but uh, who studies um, dehumanization. And I really urge people to listen to what he has to say, because we're seeing dehumanization at, at a new scale occurring. Uh, and, and it doesn't bode well for anybody, not least the Palestinians, uh, but certainly not the Israelis. Maz, the host of Voices of War podcast, thank you so much for your time and expertise today. Janie, thank you.